Thank you very much. So, step care. No surprise, everybody in this room knows mental disorders affect large numbers of people uh, across Australia. And unfortunately, even with the changes in Medicare that took place a few years back, um, we've still got less than half of people with mental disorders getting help uh, in any one year. Um, I was going for a walk in the UK, came across this sign. It actually says concealed entrance. And uh, I think that says still quite a lot about our current service model. The government understandably is concerned about the costs of Medicare. Um, those of us who are psychologists could have told them it was going to cost them a packet if they opened it up to psychologists because the market is there, the need is there, people will use it and they did and they do. And so they're worried about this open-ended cost and they're saying, what can we do? Um, it's not that we want to begrudge people getting care, but we want to actually open it up so more people can get care. Well, currently, the way in which we typically work is we do an assessment with people. Um, we try to be as wise as we possibly can and work out what service might be needed for them, either treating it within the practice or referring on to some kind of specialist service, typically the people that we know and trust. And we're keen to see you know, the needs of our, our people being protected. We want to know that they're going to get a good service and they're going to come back happy. The problem is that that actually results in a very high cost of care because we tend to then overuse the specialist services. And Mark was talking about some of those issues already in his last talk. And the other thing that perhaps you may not be aware of is that, in fact, we're not very good at knowing who needs what service. Um, and the research on this shows that the kinds of predictors that we typically use are actually not good predictors of who responds well to what service. So the science behind that is actually not particularly good. Now, um, you know about the review. We've heard about it this morning uh, in a number of ways. Um, but the key element uh, to this review is the emphasis on PHNs uh, as the, uh, the conduit, the gateway to services. Not the only gateway, let me emphasise, um, but a gateway to services. Um, and that they want to have step care. Um, so we need to actually find out what that might be. Their emphasis particularly is on step care for low to moderate severity conditions and they would like to see fewer people with those conditions being referred directly to um, clinical psychologists in, in uh, better access and more of them going other pathways. This is also recommended by the UK's NICE guidelines, which actually preceded the, the government's um, uh, work here by some years. And specifically there, as you can see, for anxiety and particularly OCD and for depression. So what is step care? Well, step care, the idea of that is that you, you, lose, you use sorry, the lower intensity, lower cost services before you actually call on the higher cost specialist services. It's intended to be self-correcting in that an essential part of step care is that there be regular assessment to see how the person is going. I can't emphasize that enough. If that regular assessment is not there, step care is not being implemented. And as part of this, you need to step up to additional care if the person is not responding. And there needs to be some kind of streaming of people right at the very start, so that if they need high intensity care at the start, they can get it immediately. Some examples of that. Um, in the UK, have you heard of the uh, increased access to psychological treatment program in the UK, the IAPT program. Uh, it started out with some trials and has now become national. The impetus behind that, interestingly, was economic. Um, the government was concerned about the uh, productivity cost of mental um, health conditions in, uh, in the UK. They also were concerned about lack of access to appropriate treatment 
They also were trying to grapple with the fact that if everybody had high cost care, there's no way the economy could afford it. And so they worked out a model of how to do this uh, while keeping costs contained. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. We do have uh, some Australian models, um, uh, a group from Adelaide and uh, predominantly, but also collaborating with James Bennett Levy, who uh, you may know from the north coast of New South Wales. Uh, we're looking at an adaptation of this for Australia. Um, and uh, there is currently some work being done in some pilot areas uh, funded by Beyond Blue and Movember. Movember because of the concern about men's access in particular. Um, potentially though, as you know in the models, this could be peer supported um, and we can come back to that with further discussion later in this session. And then we have digital mental health services. The rationale, it's not just economic, it's also ethical. That is, we don't want people to be experiencing um, significant burden and stigma from having to go to services that um, they might find embarrassing or difficult to access. We want to make sure that they can get appropriate access and that that is equitable across the country because there has been significant concern about the lack of equity of access for people in rural and regional areas, particularly remote areas in Australia. And the other thing is that low-cost services do have substantial impact. Um, and they do incur low risk, contrary to what um, was uh, raised some concerns by some of the professional organisations in particular. Um, I took this picture some years ago, um, going out to do a workshop actually in Bula Wheeler. So I, I was driving through this area which had had a bushfire only a week before. And for me, this is a really important slide. It reminds me about the fact that people are extraordinarily resilient and often don't need a lot to actually help them to get back on the road to good mental health. Um, and sometimes I think we overestimate um, the degree to which um, support is, is uh, always required. So what is that IAPT model? Step one is GP care and GP assessment, uh, assessment. And step two, if the person needs it, is low intensity care. That involves an assessment that takes about an hour in their model. Um, and they were using bibliotherapy because it's, at the time there was a limited range of digital mental health services in the UK, so they didn't actually take that on board, particularly in the early stages of their model. Then there's only two to four face-to-face -face sessions or phone sessions. If they're on the phone, they typically only take about 20 minutes. Face-to-face, -face, they're typically a little bit longer. Um, and um, that, is, that is the model that's being looked at when we look at the response. Very low intensity, low cost. And interestingly, they don't involve um, clinical psychologists. They involve a specially trained workforce um, that is a paraprofessional workforce. They are um, closely supervised by clinical psychologists, however, and all of the work they do is closely monitored. So their role is primarily to coach the use of the bibliotherapy um, and to give very simple kinds of interventions that people can apply. Then, of course, if the person does not respond or if the person immediately needed something of higher intensity, they would be streamed to the high-intensity service. And if they didn't respond to the regular high-intensity outpatient service, then they look at secondary mental health services, including inpatient treatment. In the Australian version of this, it works pretty much the same, except that um, people are referred back to GPs if they uh, require assessment as to whether they need the higher intensity work. The outcomes in the UK are remarkable. Recovery rates are 40 to 60 percent, which is comparable to what people would get in a standard treatment. Very low deterioration, um, better than many regular services in fact. In the trials in Australia, um, looking at the percentages that have mild to no symptoms at post. You can see there for both depression and anxiety, um, they're 70% or greater. In some circumstances, they can even be better. Um, there's now enough trials to be able to do meta-analyses um, for um, at least depression and anxiety. 
Um, the recovery rates there are very much the same as what I was talking about in the IAP trials themselves. And the odds against usual care are 1.3, meaning that um, they're significantly better. Let's have a look at how this looks like in a meta-analysis graph. Um, uh, I assume that you're familiar with these. The thing to look at is the diamond down the bottom. And you want to see whether that is overlapping with zero. And you can see that there's about a, a 0.4 standard deviation better um, than usual care here. For anxiety, the same thing. The graph's turned around the other way, just to confuse you. Um, but you can see it's remarkably close to the same kind of effect size. And 0.4 of a standard deviation is regarded as a, as a um, small to moderate effect size. So that is superiority effect size, not the effect or the actual treatment. Um, I'm not saying that step care is necessarily better than other care. Um, I think the key thing here is what I said before, that is that step care has a lot of assessment around it. It monitors how the person is going. It responds appropriately if the person is not recovering. And if we did that as systematically in our standard care, I suspect we'd get similar results. Now, we don't yet have a national version of IAPT in Australia. Those Beyond Blue trials at this stage are, are um, just pilot trials. But, I mean, they may get um, to a national basis. And there is flexibility in the PHN to develop models um, within each PHN as well. But we do have national digital mental health services. And at least some of those actually function remarkably uh, similarly to, um, to what we were talking about with IAPT. I'll have a look at that in a minute. Just an aside, we can do this because Australia is now very e-connected. Um, these are data from last year because I haven't got this year's data yet, but already at that point, six months access across the whole country was 92 per cent, um, and six per cent had never accessed it, um, and that was down from 10 per cent in 2010. Um, the key way forward that we have is smartphones. Uh, smartphones are uh, gathering pace much faster than um, internet connections at home at this point. And anybody clever who is actually working now in this space is thinking about how we can actually be delivering to smartphones and tablets. There's the, uh, the data by age. No surprise to anyone in this room that younger people are the fastest group to take this up. But have a look at the older group, even the 65 plus at that point, around a third of people um, with smartphones or tablets. The barriers are disappearing. I can imagine some of you in the room saying yes, but, and uh, I, I remember years ago a uh, workshop I gave in Kingaroy where somebody was talking about a uh, page upload as a cup of tea time. Uh, it's not quite that bad now, although I know it can be very slow. So there is much wider web access. It's not universal, it's not necessarily fast, although um, uh, Mark may share with you, if he hasn't already, his experience on how to get fast access using satellite. Uh, socioeconomic barrier is also a significant one still. Um, so people might have a smartphone, but they don't necessarily use it for um, uploading pages because um, it it actually costs them so much money to, um, to the data access. Um, that is an issue, um, but it is something that you can get around if, um, if we can provide um, data points where uh, people can uh, link in with Wi-Fi and then download things. The advantage of the apps on phones is that you don't have to have the data access once you've got the app on the phone. Um, so, from the government's point of view, when they're talking about e-mental health or digital mental health, what do they mean? They actually mean everything. So they don't just mean the modern stuff. They also mean Lifeline and Kids Helpline and all of those sort of services as well. Anything which is electrical, which link people in. An example of a web program that some of you might be familiar with, of course, is Mood Gym. It's the most well-known one. It's been around the longest in Australia. Um, and that is an, an example of a self-guided depression program, but there are a number of others now in the field. An example of a 
therapist guide and model um, that is well known amongst GPs because Gavin Andrews has done an excellent job of telling everybody about it uh, is the um, This Way Up work um, coming out of the Anxiety Disorders Unit at uh, St Vincent's Hospital. And a more recent version is um, Mindspot, which is funded by the federal government, and I'll talk about a little bit more detail in a moment. Each of these programs that provide therapist support are essentially providing a form of low-intensity CBT that's not unlike the IAPT model. So in terms of this particular program, for example, it's run as a series of six-week courses they're available for a variety of people, older age people, they even have an indigenous one. Um, uh, anxiety, depression, cross disorder um, tends to uh, work in order to be able to provide people with assistance where their symptoms really are crossing over between disorders. An excellent program. So over about six weeks, you have access to online uh, uh, resources but also you interact with a clinical psychologist, not, not a, one of the other workforce we're talking about. The clinical psychologist is interacting with you to provide you support and coaching in how you use that um, resource. That is free, it is national, um, funded by the federal government. And I commend it to you. So in fact, uh, WED programs, particularly when they are supported, Unbelievably, they have similar effects with anxiety and depression, um, particularly in low to moderate conditions, to regular face-to-face -face care with a clinical psychologist. My colleagues don't like me saying that. Here's the data. Remember what I said to you about the diamond? It's smack on zero. You can't get any closer to zero than that. So um, supported web-based treatment gives you the same effects um, on uh, in this case, uh, depression, I believe. No, this is uh, both depression and anxiety um, as face-to-face -face treatment. And those strong effects are also maintained in standard services. I mentioned MindSpot. This is the MindSpot data. Improvements in depression on the PHQ-9. Start off with the, um, the left-hand side here. People in normal range, when they start, this is the percentage of people in normal range. This is the people... In severe range, when, sorry, this is the people in severe range when they start. At the end of treatment, 35% in the normal range and another 33% in mild range. Um, and at follow-up three months, in this case, um, they, those effects are maintained. And uh, that's virtually identical to the effects that they get in the randomised controlled trials that are behind all of their work. And the reason that they get that, by the way, is because they have excellent training and excellent supervision in relation to every individual client. Um, and they provide feedback to the general practitioner on progress. So when we're looking at the amount of people who are now using digital mental health care, one of the things that the government asked us to do was to find out just what the numbers are. And so we went to all of the providers uh, in Australia and ask them, not for, not for people who access your website, that's hugely bigger than these numbers, these are people who actually register for service. So new registrations for service from each of the providers. And you can see that if we, if we include the phone services, we're now up to around 1.3 million Australians each year who are using some form of digital service. And we're up to 180,000 per year who are using those web programs. In terms of referrals, the number are much, numbers are much smaller, but the other thing we ask the providers to tell us is where did these people come from? We want to see whether they came from GPs or from other practitioners, um, or whether they were self-referred. And as you can see, the referrals from practitioners are rising. Um, they're rising particularly from GPs still lower than what we'd like, but they, they are rising. Uh, here's an interesting point. The government's work, and what I'm going to suggest to you, you, you should do, uh, is, uh, is stream off people with low to moderate conditions. Remember I said to you we're not very good at knowing who's going to actually respond from what? This is a real, really good example of that. 
more severe people do not do worse on these low intensity treatment. Greater severity of problems is not a predictor of who responds to this treatment. Um, these are data from the UK, um, exactly the same thing has been found by MindSpot because they look at this in a lot of detail to um, see what's happening with their people. Now, those of you who are statisticians in the room or can remember your stats training might remember something called regression to the mean. Um, what this means is that if you start off at a higher level, you've got further to fall. So it's possible that there that is a confound in these, in these data. But even so, what it's suggesting to us is that even people who are quite with quite severe conditions will respond. I, I actually had to be reminded of this myself. When I started work in this field, I wasn't working with the internet. I was working with sending people snail mail letters back in 1995. And we were sending them letters to s assist them with alcohol use disorder. And we were able to obtain around about a 40% reduction in people's drinking, well maintained through to 12 months. But when we did national media about this, we got people from very remote areas wanting to be involved. And some of them were drinking what I could only call industrial quantities of alcohol. And we, we were, as you might imagine, quite concerned about these people reducing their drinking without appropriate medical supervision um, uh, in relation to their withdrawal. And we gave them advice, of course, that they needed to get such supervision, and we monitored how they went. What we were surprised to find is that they did just as well as everybody else. <laughs> um, they, they were, we didn't have a single case where somebody actually had a negative effect, um, and it was probably because of the fact that they were doing it sensibly, reducing it slowly rather than doing it immediately. Um, but, you know, I don't recommend this. But we had a choice there. If this person didn't get help from us, they weren't going to get help at all. They were in very remote areas of the Kimberley and other places of Australia. And so we thought, mm, ethical problem here, but we, we thought it was best to actually offer a service. And remarkably, they survived, uh, which is, you breathe a sigh of relief when you're a researcher and that happens. Uh, but obviously, I would not recommend that you do that. I would not recommend that it is appropriate practice, and nor would I be suggesting that we send people with very severe conditions to low intensity, um, just because of caution. Um, and we really do want to make sure that people are not ill-affected by uh, going into these services. So, what will this, all of this mean for step care in practice? Um, at this stage, there is no announcement of any change to better access. And um, whilst, as I said before, I'm sure that the government would like to see fewer people going to better access with mild conditions, at this point they are not forcing that to occur. And let's hope that they don't. Um, however, uh, I think we do need to think about how to actually do this more effectively. And what I'm about to present is my view because we don't at this stage have any uh, advice from the government about how this should be done. Not that I've seen anyway, although with the number of things that have been coming out recently, who knows, there may be something that's stuck there in the internet that we haven't seen. Okay, this is the traditional way that we would do it in primary care. So the GP makes an assessment, identifies a mental health issue, and either treats it themselves, um, particularly if it's mild or moderate, or if it's more severe, uh, it refers to a crisis or community uh, service or potentially to inpatient treatment. Um, with mild to, to moderate conditions, uh, we also would be considering better access or some other uh, um, outpatient service, such as a um, privately practicing psychiatrist. What is now being suggested is that we have an intervening uh, process. That is that if the person has a mild to moderate condition and uh, they want uh, self-guided care, that is they really want to be managing this condition themselves and they just want to have some tips on how to do it, um, then that would stream them towards the left. If they wanted the clinician-guided approach, they would be in the middle. And if they're unable to access um, e-mental health because they uh, uh, didn't have the equipment or the web access or whatever, uh, or 
they had tried it and didn't benefit from it, or at this stage at least, um, if they preferred uh, to not use it, um, then they would be in that right-hand one. And the services would be accordingly. Does that make sense? Now, remember what I said about what was essential in step care? Um, there must be some form of further assessment. And the other thing about those dotted lines is that if you are referring to better access, bear in mind that the person can also benefit from adjunctive um, digital support, particularly if there's a waiting list for that service, and there often is in rural and regional areas, a waiting list that can be quite considerable. Um, the person could benefit in the meantime from being able to use a digital service. We're also, by the way, suggesting that um, providers um, also consider using this as part of their service to increase the impact that they can get from the limited number of sessions they can get from Medicare. <coughs> what happens after that review? Well, either the person is now seen as being more severe or they're not fully recovered or they are getting some benefit and you can see some potential for further benefit from uh, a low intensity service then I'm suggesting that you go through the similar pathways to before. And again, there needs to be a further review. We need to be seeing conditions, particularly conditions like depression, as being chronic diseases. They are potentially recurring disorders. So even if the person is recovered, you need to be considering um, the, the fact that they are um, at risk of further um, uh, episodes. So. Don't quite know what the future holds, um, but I think there are some guidelines that can help us. Um, overall, uh, I would suggest to you that you be well versed in what is out there. Um, if you visit our eMental Health in Practice website, MPRAC uh, website, then you can actually um, access uh, ways of being able to um, identify services that we write for the person who's sitting before you. And there is also a service called Mind Health Connect, um, which is a catalogue of services. Yes, thank you. Could you hold that up? Have you all got this in your pack? Um, that is the current snapshot of what is available there. You might notice the way in which we do it. We give you three ways of finding a service, a digital service. One is by the condition. The second is by the group, and the third is by the type of service that people are after. So we think you, you'll find that um, a useful way to go. The Mind Health Connect site is um, currently uh, under change. Um, you might have heard the government is developing a mental health gateway. Um, the initial gateway, uh, they are telling us now, is going to be due in March. My best guess is it'll be next September. Um, but despite my agitation, um, the first pass on this is not going to be for practitioners, it's going to be for community users. Um, and so it, it won't be ideal uh, for you to use it when you're searching for your, um, for your patients. Um, however, uh, there will be one which is going to be um, particularly suited to practitioners down the track. Uh, and we're going to ensure that it's a lot better than the one that you get on Mind Health Connect, which I don't think works very well at the moment. So that's the situation from me, and uh, I don't think it really is a matter of sunset. I think it's a matter of blue sky. <laughs>